Uh, hallelujah. I tell you what, I am, I am just sitting on dead ready to bring the Word of God. I'm excited about the message that the Lord has given me today. Uh, still in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we talked last week, spoke last week from Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, I know I was rather long. I really wanted to get those two chapters put together into one sermon. Could've, I could have broken down into seven sermons. So just think about that. I could have made last week into seven really easy one on each each of those churches but we didn't but uh, we're going to continue on we've looked at what was in the book of Revelation we've looked at what is talking about the seven churches and then what was to come we've begun by looking at what those seven churches represented the seven ages of the church different time periods in the church and as we open chapter four chapter four and five go together and we begin to we step literally into the throne room of God and we are going to pause at the beginning of that experience in chapter 4 just w one verse whereas last week I tried to get through two chapters I'm going to get through one verse today kind of focusing on one little phrase in this first verse Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 before we read let's pray one more time Father I pray right now that you would open our hearts and our minds Father to the truth of your word the blessed hope that is ours in this revelation of Jesus Christ and his return Lord we know that there is tribulation coming upon this world Father we know that there are going to be some, some very dark days that come but Father we as the people of God are looking to our blessed hope today and I pray God right now that there would be an outpouring of the spirit that would just just rock solid this into our hearts and lives that no fear would be able to come no anxiety no dread of any kind because we know that we are living on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ that you are our righteousness you are our hope hallelujah you are our salvation and we're trusting in that today Lord open our hearts and our minds to see the glory of your word and your plan as we study today in Jesus name Amen and amen. Marty, if you'll reach on there on, uh, I think it's channel number 20. It's the very last one to the right of that big thing. And just pull it down a little bit. It's the main slider there. It's kind of in the middle of the board. I just feel like I'm really loud this morning. Does anybody else feel like I'm loud? No? Okay. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. John says, after these things. What things? Well, he just looked at the, just writ, wrote down the seven letters to the seven churches, which we saw represented the seven ages of the church. So after the seven ages of the church, after the church time period, after those things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things so after John has looked into the church age after John has has saw what God is going to be doing through the church age now John God says to John the voice says come up here and I'll show you even more of what is to come most premillennial prophecy teachers and we I said from the very beginning that we are looking at the book of Revelation from a premillennial viewpoint, a premillennial rapture of the church. I don't know if you remember me talking about this when we first started. Those who believe the rapture of the church will happen before the tribulation, pre-tribulation rapture people. That's who I am. That's who the assemblies of God are. Hopefully that's who you are. There are some who believe in a post-millennial rapture, uh, the return of Christ alone, no real rapture of the church, just the return of Christ after the rapture or after the tribulation. 
That is not the viewpoint we're looking at. Some do not believe in, in this at all and believe that uh, very differently yet even more. And I'm not going to go into all that. But from a premillennial pre prophecy perspective, when, when the Spirit says to John, come up here, we see that as a depiction of the rapture of the church. At the end of the church age, Jesus is going to step out and say, come up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's going to come up here. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. More and more and more. The more I study Revelation, the more I listen to prophecy teaching, I am excited about the return of Jesus Christ. The more wicked this world becomes, the more out of control it seems to be, I'm looking for Jesus to come. But let me remind you, things are not out of control. They're just falling into place in God's time period. The rapture of the church. You say, Pastor Mike, what exactly are you talking about? Well, well, it's described for us in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writing this says this. For we, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain. I'm just looking. Are you alive? Are you still here? So it applies to us, Barbara. It applies to us. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep or precede those who have died. We will not precede them. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is what Paul talks about as the rapture of the church. When John was taken up into heaven, he witnesses this great worship around the throne of God. And we're going to look into that into more detail next week. But I wanted to stop right here and, and help us to understand why we believe the rapture of the church. And we'll look at, at those two chapters. But at, at the conclusion of, of the worship scene, in the end of chapter or actually in the middle of chapter 5 Jesus begins to open this scroll that he's been given and again we're going to look at it and that is the beginning of the tribulation when the scroll is open and the, and the wrath of God begins to be poured out but the Bible tells us we have not been prepared for wrath but for righteousness we have been prepared for the blessings of God through Jesus Christ and we're going to look as we move on into the rest of what is to come, the tribulation and, and then the reign of Jesus Christ upon this earth and uh, that thousand year millennial reign and then to come the final judgment, then the, the kingdom of God will be made eternal and we will live in eternity. But there's a lot that goes on between now and that very end. But what really kicks it off is the return of Jesus Christ. But what I want us to look at today is why we believe that the rapture is the next thing in the events of the church. I want to look at Daniel chapter 9 so we can better understand the rapture. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel, Daniel was fasting and praying. He was praying first repentance in Daniel chapter 9. He had realized he'd studied the writings of Jeremiah and Jeremiah had prophesied. Daniel, remember, where, where was Daniel at? Somebody tell me where Daniel was at. What, where, what nation, what place was he at? Babylon. He, he and the people of Israel, many of them had been taken to Babylon in captivity. Remember that? Okay, so they're in captivity in Babylon. Now they're not in chains, but they're being held there and they're serving the Babylonians. But Daniel begins to realize the prophecies of Jeremiah said that they would be in captivity for 70 years and then they would be released. And Jeremiah, or excuse me, Daniel begins to realize that the 70 year period is almost over. Daniel is an old man by this point. He is, he is probably at least in his 60s, perhaps even much older than that. But the end of this 70 year period is about, and so he begins to pray and to fast. And in the midst of this prayer, God sends a, a word to him. And it, it begins 
begins to tell him about what is to take place for the Jewish people. And this is what it says in Daniel 9. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. Who are the people of Daniel? Who are the people of Daniel? The Hebrews, Israel, the Jews, okay? Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, mm. to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. Seventy weeks now, and I will talk about it a little bit more in a minute. Those weeks are are seven periods of years so it's 70 times seven years 490 years is what is being talked about here and all this is going to be completed the finish of transgression and end of sin an atonement for sin everlasting righteousness the end of vision and prophecy and the anointing of the holy place all that's going to happen in 490 years <laughs> You're saying, whoa, 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 how does that happen? Daniel lived more than 490 years ago. Well, let's see. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had been dr completely wiped out by the Babylonians, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again, talking about Jerusalem, will be built again with plaza and moat or plaza and walls, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood to the end that there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he... We're not going to talk about who he is, but notice that word. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, one period of seven years. But in the middle of that week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So, again, Daniel praying God sends him and this angel who begins to reveal to him the things about what is to come and what is to come is 490 years 70 70 sevens 70 sevens a week is seven days and what it was referring to is 70 sevens of years in, in reality the Hebrew does not say week it says sevens 70 sevens so 490 years and it would begin with this decree that would be made by a king who was King Cyrus of the Medes. And the king of, Cy of Media, Cyrus, made a declaration not too long after Daniel had this vision. And he said... The Jews are released to return to their homeland. They have permission and supply to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah deal with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. If you want to read that, you'll understand that a little bit better. So this decree was made. So from the time that decree was made for seven years for one set of seven and then for 69 excuse me 62 sevens so that's 483 years altogether why was it broken up into 62 plus seven to get 69 most scholars believe that 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 seven sevens at the beginning which was 49 years was the length of time it took to build jerusalem rebuild jerusalem and to rebuild the temple so that was one time period and then another set of 62 times 7 years altogether 483 years I know y'all are looking at me like I'm, I'm lost just get it a decree is made 483 years later is the coming of Messiah 
That was who? Who was that? Jesus. That's right. So the whole idea is that the Jews could, could keep track of time and they could tell, hey, it's been almost 483 years. Now, here's the hard part. They didn't have very good calendars and they didn't keep very good records. So knowing the exact day that Cyrus made that decree in the records is hard to distinguish. We know about when, but we don't have the exact day, week, month, so kind of thing. But they knew it was getting close. There was, you, we don't understand this because the Bible doesn't talk about it much, but there was a great anticipation in Israel about the time that Jesus was born. They were expecting the Messiah at any time. The problem was they weren't expecting the Messiah to come like Jesus came. And because he came different than they expected, what happened? They rejected him. The Messiah was cut off. Just exactly as Daniel's prophecy said. After 69 weeks, the Messiah would be cut off. And that's what happened. The Jews rejected him. And it wasn't the Messiah was cut off as much as Israel was cut off. Israel re rejected the Messiah and God cut them off. We're going to look at that in just a moment. What we don't understand is that 69 weeks, the prophecy is concerning 70 weeks or 77s. So there's still another seven year period. And that's what we're waiting on because the, the time period between the 69th and the 70 week, we don't know how long that is. The Bible doesn't tell us, but that is what we call the times of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles. Jeremiah speaks about this 70th week in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. Read along with me. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now let me tell you, Israel is in captivity at Babylon when this word was spoken. So they're in Babylon in captivity, and God says, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers and they shall possess it. Now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror of dread and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male, a man can give birth. What is the answer to that question? Can a man give birth? What is the answer to that question? Come on, tell me. What's the answer? Can a man give birth? Just want to make sure you understand that because the world seems to be confused about that today. Men cannot give birth. Okay? So that's the answer. Man cannot. Then the question goes on. Well, then why do I see every man with his hands on his loin as a woman in childbirth? Because he's in pain. Why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for the day is great, there is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress. Who is Jacob? Who is Jacob? Jacob is Israel. Jacob was Israel's name before God changed his name to Israel. Okay? This is the time of Israel's distress, Israel's trouble. But he will be saved from him. It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck. There's that, that, that word again. His yoke. Whose yoke? Well, we'll talk about it later. His yoke from off of their neck, off of Israel's neck, and will tear off their bonds, and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king. That's talking about the Messiah, whom I will raise up for them. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant servant says the Lord and do not be dismayed O Israel for behold I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity and Jacob will return and be quiet and at ease and no one will make him afraid for I am with you declares the Lord to save you for I will destroy all the nations where I have scattered you I want you to catch that. I will destroy completely all the nations, plural, where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you 
completely but I will chasten you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished. So Jeremiah here talks about this seven-year time of distress. Jacob's trouble, often it's referred to. It is the time of the great tribulation that we know will be the last seven years uh, in earth's natural history. God promises to bring Israel back before that time of distress. Now, when Jeremiah wrote this and he says, I'm going to restore the fortunes of Israel, Israel thought when, when Cyrus made the decree and would release them to come back, that that's what he was talking about. But I don't believe this is what Jeremiah is talking about at all because Israel never experienced fortunes and blessing like they had under King David and King Solomon. Never again have they experienced that. In fact, they've experienced distress after distress after distress, problem upon problem. They were a nation again. Yes, they did rise up after they rebuilt Jerusalem and, and, and the temple. They did become a nation again. During the days of Jesus, the nation of Israel existed, but not to her former glory. God promised to restore them to their fortunes and that he would in turn destroy the nations, plural. He would destroy the nations. He would punish Israel, but he would not completely destroy them. So there is prophesied through Daniel and through Jeremiah a time of trouble and a time of distress after Messiah is cut off. A time of punishment that was going to come upon Israel. Remember, they were God's chosen people. Not because they were special. They were chosen to be made special. This is my special chair. Looks just like the rest of the chairs here, doesn't it? But I'm going to set it up here. And now, it's my special chair. Abraham was just one in the crowd. But God said, I, I pick you. And I'm going to make you special. And through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Through Abraham, through Israel, came the Messiah. He wasn't blessed, he wasn't special there, but God picked him out and made him special. So when we talk about Israel being God's chosen people, it wasn't because they were special beforehand, but God chose them to make them special. Okay, always remember that. But they remain God's chosen people. But the problem was, God said, for you to be my chosen people, you've got to remain faithful. You've got to remain with me. But Israel kept running off, huh? Kept going after other gods. Kept doing things they weren't supposed to do. And God brought punishment upon them. Listen to these words that uh, Jesus spoke to his disciples when they asked him about Israel's future, okay? During the days Jesus was here, we're in still that 483 year period of Israel's history, that 62 plus 7, 69 times 7 year period. Jesus is there. Messiah has not been cut off. He is with them, in fact. But they said, What is going? The disciples said to him, What is going to take place? Listen to Luke 21, verse 20 to 24. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Jesus was talking about what was going to happen about 30 to 40 years after he died and rose and went to heaven. It was in AD 70 that Rome came and put down a rebellion that had begun in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The army surrounded her, laid siege, and Jerusalem was destroyed. So that's what he's talking about. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land, and wrath to this 
people and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled under by the Gentiles listen until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled here is that key phrase, the time of the Gentiles. It is the time that we're living in now. From the time that Jesus the Messiah was cut off until he returns is the time of the Gentiles. It is the time period that's undefined. It's between the 69th week and the 70th week. Between the time the Messiah is cut off and this great tribulation week occurs, this seven years occurs. It is the time of the Gentiles. It's an undisclosed period of time. We don't know how long it will last, but we are given clues. And the times of the Gentiles, listen to me, this is important for us to understand, is the time when God punishes Israel for rejecting their Messiah. When they cut him off, now God brings his punishment. You say, what punishment? Look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 28. These are words we need to hear and recognize. Deuteronomy 28, beginning at verse 65. If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord, which is Yahweh, your God. If you don't do this, verse 59, then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. He will bring on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid and they will cling to you and every sickness and every plague which not written in the book of this law the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed then you shall be left few in number whereas you are numerous as the stars of the heaven because you did not obey the Lord your God it shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you I love that phrase God delights to prosper those who are his Catch me. Come on. Get with me. The Lord loves to prosper those who are His. Okay? As much as He delighted to prosper you and multiply you, so, oh my, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you. And you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples. Listen, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. He's not talking merely about Babylon and Syria that they went into captivity. From one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest. And there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. So God, all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, when the law is being established, when God is raising up this people, God tells him, I've chosen you out. I've called you to be special to me. But if you choose to go your own way, if you reject me and go another, I will bring punishment upon you. Sickness and disease, but also I am going to cast you among the nations, plural, from one end of the earth to the other. Hallelujah. I, I, I love that phrase. He says, as much as I delighted to, to give you blessings, I'm going to, as it were, delight to bring upon you cursings because you have rejected me. You say, God delights in cursing us in comparison. That's what he is saying. To compare as good as I was to you then, now I'm going to punish you. As much as I've given and given and given, now I'm going to take and take and take. As much as I bless, 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 now I'm going to curse. This really began in the year A.D. 70. I mentioned it a while ago. A.D. 70, about 35, 40 years after Jesus died, was buried, rose from the grave, and ascended back to the Father. So the church is about 35 years old. But in that time, 
the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people rose up in rebellion against Rome. Rome was the, the world empire. They were ruling over Israel. We know about that. The Romans were in Israel when Jesus was alive. So this is about 35 years later. And they rise up in rebellion. And Rome sends the armies. He doesn't, they don't send a little attachment. They send armies to quell this rebellion that's going on in Israel. Israel had been looked down upon for, for many years already because they were rebellious in their nature. Now the army is coming. And they laid siege to Jerusalem for, for a considerable length of time. I don't remember exactly how long it was. But eventually Jerusalem, the walls, they penetrated. There were like three or four different walls that had been built over the years as Jerusalem expanded and the Romans got through the first three outer walls quickly and the fourth the very inner wall the very inner part of the city old David city it was the last to fall but when it finally fell the Romans came in and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem they destroyed the city of Jerusalem they tore down the temple they burnt the temple Hundreds of thousands, by history's count, hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed in that sacking of, of Jerusalem and all that took place. Many, many Jewish people were taken captive by the Romans and made slaves and scattered throughout the Roman Empire among the nations. Those who survived, who were able to escape, left Israel and went and, and hid themselves in the surrounding nations all around. Does that sound like what God said in Deuteronomy? I will scatter you. In, the, in, in about 60 years later, in the year 132, for those Jews who were left, there was another uprising again. About 60 years after that, in the year 132, this uprising and Rome sent her armies again. And this time it says that they raised. We have this weird language called English. And raise can sound like two things. You know, you raise something up or you, like a razor, you scrape it down to nothing. That's the raise I'm talking about. They R-A-Z-E-D'd it. They raised the city of Jerusalem and totally destroyed it. Now they did rebuild it to some extent. But Jews were forbidden to return to the city of Jerusalem. They were fit, forbidden by the Romans. The Romans set up slave markets and sold Jews into slavery all over the world. And again, those who weren't captured fled to the nations. And from that point on, Israel has been not in our time period, I'll talk about that in a minute, but from that time for the next nearly 2,000 years, think about this, for nearly 2,000 years, the, the nation of Israel lay in ruins. Not just the city, the nation. Jerusalem was rebuilt and it continued on, but it was never anywhere to her former glory and, and eventually fell into further ruins. I want to read something to you. In the year 1867, two years after the Civil War, Mark Twain, y'all know who Mark Twain is, Samuel Clemens, went to Jerusalem, or excuse me, went to Israel to visit Israel in 1867. He was so disappointed. This is what he wrote in his, in his diary or his record of his trip. Says this, there is not a solitary, he's, number one, let me tell you, he's going through the Jezreel Valley, which is a valley in the Jezreel, along the Jezreel River. It is a beautiful, lush 